That's now each and every one of them in Japan as a result of the tsunami and resulting safety concerns and public policy concerns. Um, Japan has now converted very heavily to natural gas and LNG. Uh, but you have questions about where do we go from here? What's the next big load or is there one? Or do we instead have on the horizon a lot of supply, Australian supply, North American supply, and will we head back toward a more comfortable market or even a glut by the end of the decade? Um, the factors that would be continuing to push prices up, or sorry, rather shale spreads up, would be higher Asian gas demand, um, a North American shale gas glut continuing to depress North American prices, um, and the high Australian LNG costs and delays which would constrain supply and therefore keep prices strong on the other side of the water. But those are trends we know about and you could say maybe they're yesterday's news. I mean these are not things that are new news in the market um, and the things that might be on the horizon driving shale spreads down uh, could be a Chinese slowdown, um, <coughs> something we haven't really been thinking about or talking about until perhaps the last year uh, but is now uh, more of a real possibility on the horizon. A Japanese nuclear recovery. As I said, we've now got all the Japanese nuclear plants offline, but there is a policy push from some sectors, TEPCO and, and other players in the market, to bring some of them back. And if that actually happens uh, with any speed, that's going to basically displace LNG demand by bringing back nuclear capacity. So that would push prices down, sorry, push uh, uh, the spreads down. And uh, finally, the new LNG supply from Australia and North America. Um, if, if those both come online with any force at the end of the decade, that's a lot of capacity. Kind of like we saw years ago when we went into a gas glut with all that Qatari capacity that came online in the middle of the decade. So that's a question mark as well. Against this backdrop, we're now going into an election, as Charles mentioned, and we have um, a pretty big public policy debate probably on the horizon about gas prices and LNG exports. Um, the debate is clearly picking up. This is my perspective as an inside the Beltway guy in Washington. Um, and it's likely to get more contentious and more complicated later in the year. I've put here a quote from the Energy Secretary Stephen Chu just because I think it kind of captures some of the, uh, the difficulties in the discussion. And I'm going to read it. If the prices of natural gas are too low, it would actually stymie development. We don't want prices to spike to where they have been in other times. That really causes hardships. I think there is a middle ground where you can continue development. The gas would still be very inexpensive and make us industrially competitive and create a lot of wealth in the United States. But one thing the United States is, is historically terrible at is managing gas prices or manipulating gas prices. And we really don't believe in doing it anyway. So there's a lot of pressure coming from the industrial community, Dow Chemical in particular, but a lot of other uh, large you know, gas intensive users um, to uh, slow or limit the export of LNG, keep prices, keep the demand for gas in a reasonable range, keep prices under control so that um, this industrial renaissance that they see on the horizon can actually uh, proceed and uh, they keep this cost advantage that they're currently enjoying versus foreign markets where, that are using oil and petroleum products, very high priced products for their energy inputs or very high priced natural gas indexed to oil because of the way the LNG markets work and the way gas, market work, gas markets work in most of the rest of the world. Um, so this is going to be a, a tough debate and it's going to be a confusing debate um, because it's very hard for the US government to come up with any kind of policy that really is balanced between all these different interests and actually has um, a meaningful impact on gas prices. And just to maybe make that point, here's the chart of the variability of Henry Hub over the last, uh, better part of the last decade. And you see just how wildly gas prices swing around. We still have a relatively immature commodity that's very volatile compared to other fuels. Um, and it's, it's going to be hard um, to get away from that. Although I would say you can see in this last period, particularly since this real shale story has come online, one of the arguments that I think is very compelling from the shale community is that we now not only have low prices but much more stable prices. 
because these production costs are known, the production is ample, the supply is substantial, and we'll be moving in a tighter range. Um, the question is whether the, the exports will drive that up. So let's get into that. So far we've seen that because of the very low prices, the drillers have actually started pulling back. And this is the first time we've seen this since the shale revolution really began. Um, with gas prices down below 250 and even recently a little bit below two, um, we've seen that the, the drillers are starting to pull back. You, you have here in the chart, oops, the red line being conventional um, rig counts, the, the green and yellow being a, a kind of a representation of the dry gas, uh, dry shale wells, the dry unconventional. So you see this tremendous increase, but then as prices started picking up, uh, sorry, as prices started softening, the drilling activity pulls back. Offsetting that quite substantially until recently was the growth in the liquids rich, the NGL rich shale plays, um, up until right in the most recent period. And then we see a pullback there as well. Right now there's still a tremendous amount of drilling in the Eagleford area, which is one of the most uh, economically efficient plays in North America, but some of the others, the Marcellus wet areas of um, West Virginia, Southwest Pennsylvania have actually experienced drilling declines. So it's not just the dry gas that's pulling back anymore in favor of the wet gas in the shale um, production areas, but even some of the, the wet gas is pulling back. And that, I think, is a testament to um, what some of our analysis has been telling us that this is probably a kind of a technical bottom that the production costs on average for large volumes of production, which is what we need. We now have shale producing 25, 30% of North American supply, um, and it's headed for 50% within the decade. That's a tremendous amount of production and a huge change in the North American market. To sustain that, um, the, the economics need to work for the drillers over time. It, it just can't continue if, if they're in the red. And so, what we've shown here is for each of the plays, you know, the, 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 the width of the play reflects the, the size of reserves, the resource base, and the stack in the colors at the top above the zero line is sort of the buildup in our financial model of the average, weighted average costs of the major producers for the play. So you see um, in the Marcellus wet area and Eagleford and Kennewoodford, these production costs that might be surprising to you in the high, high fours and fives, but here this green area at the bottom is the offsetting revenue from the natural gas liquids at recent prices. So it, the net number that you come out with is here in the yellow bar. And as you can see, these ones with the tremendous liquids rich are really kind of the lowest net producers. And then when you get over to the plays that are mostly dry, you have higher production costs. So anyway, with $2 gas, 250 gas, you're at the bottom. Um, it's not to say there aren't really sweet spots within some of the plays that can do fine there, but to produce 30% or more of North American supply at those price levels is not sustainable. Now, where do we go from here on this price debate? We have demand um, on the horizon picking up quite rapidly. We've already seen a lot of up uptick in natural gas fired generation. Uh, we don't feel it yet in the market, but there is a tremendous amount of industrial construction activity underway in the areas of petrochemicals, chemicals, methanol, um, and some heavy metals and so forth that are gas intensive. They're thriving on the shale spread and their competitive advantage against foreign markets. Um, and we have also this, this big policy discussion about natural gas vehicles. Quite a bit less load involved in the NGV story, but, uh, but potential long-term growth that could be substantial. So how, at what point, and then of course the LNG exports themselves, bringing who knows how much, but five, seven, eight, 10, 12 BCFD of exports on top of this tremendous demand growth. So we're asking the question, how far does it go? You know, how much of this demand can be served and how much of a, a stress on the shale production capabilities does it represent? Um, this is a, a representation of the outlook for power demand in North America um, based on some of our, uh, my colleagues in our power groups modeling. 
And the main point I want to bring out is just that there's a range out there that we see of perhaps just over five to as much as 10 BCFD of incremental demand by the end of the decade. And, and perhaps even more if you can factor in um, some of the coal retirements associated with even more aggressive policy than we have right now for the control of emissions from uh, coal-fired plants. So that's, that's already a substantial amount of growth. And then turning to the industrial sector, we see a range in the three to five BCFD um, uh, range there. It's about half of the potential growth in the power sector, but still very substantial. As I mentioned, there's the chemicals, methanol, uh, there's some GTL plants um, that, that could drive the numbers up toward five or six, but um, probably a good ballpark for the end of the decade is, is three to four. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, we don't feel that in the market now, but that, that investment is ongoing and those loads will start to come online progressively over the next two, three years. So then, I, I didn't get into the, uh, the NGVs, but there is one more slide that'll show that, that it's not a big number, but there's perhaps up to a BCFD or thereabouts coming from the vehicle sector as well, from almost no base. I mean, there's very little consumption in the transport section right now for natural gas. Now we come to the question of LNG exports and how much of that can be sustained. We have at the top, if you can see it, uh, some of the early movers and the, you know, the big name projects, particularly the, the Sabine Pass Chenier project, a um, couple trains, the Kitimat project, the first train, but we also have here in, in a next phase, Freeport, Lake Charles. With, at the time we presented this chart or prepared it, we didn't include some of the ones that are making a lot of progress right now. Uh, Cameron, Cove Point, uh, Cove Point has some tough environmental issues with the Sierra Club and so forth, but they've been uh, making a lot of commercial project, uh, progress with Japanese buyers recently, as has Cameron. So there's a couple more down in this group that maybe should be moved up uh, pretty soon, but even just with this core group of four new terminals, you have a range of as little as 3.5 BCFD to up to 7.3, and if you throw in, say, uh, you know, a couple more in the one to two BCFD range. It's not hard to imagine up to 10 BCFD over the midterm, say by the end of the decade or, or early in the next decade. So then again, you have up to 10 BCFD in the power sector, up to five in the industrial sector, and perhaps another five to 10 in the LNG export sector. It's a lot of demand. Here's how it all stacks up. Uh, there's the 10, that's Consider this a high case, but it's, it's a, to, to paint a picture of what the potential is. Um, the 10 in the power sector, 5 in the industrial, 1.3 in the NGV. And here's kind of a load factor adjusted and a ramp up adjusted number for the LNG exports as an actual export volume as opposed to a capacity number. So that gets you, gets us, there it goes again, uh, from a current market of about 65 BCFD in the United States up to almost 86. It's, it's potentially quite a bit of growth uh, by the end of the decade. Again, on the high side, not all of this will happen, uh, but this is where we see the, the outer range of the potential. The LNG number is actually the one that could probably be higher and the domestic demand could probably be lower. As we start to export this LNG, what will happen to global balances? There would be impacts, of course, on U.S. prices because of all the additional load, but what would be the impact on international prices in Asia, in Europe, particularly in Asia, where the prices are so high, the markets have been so constrained, and will all this incremental LNG just pull the floor out from under those prices? There's been talk over the years about global indexing, uh, global prices, greater liquidity. The Indians have been agitating for some sort of Asian spot market price. We think those things are pretty remote and the, the oil indexing convention will, will die hard and it won't die soon. Um, but still, we have to ask the question, what happens in a looser market with more supply um, relative to demand and, and how will prices soften under oil indexation? So we looked at the Australian terminals and their costs, their delays, um, some of their economic fundamentals and we developed a hypothesis about which ones would be impacted um, in terms of 
being deferred, pushed back in time, possibly being destroyed or canceled as a result of the LNG exports. And what we came up with is from the 5.3 of exports, you might have up to three BCFD of Australian supply that's damaged or deferred as a result. It won't all go forward. So there's kind of a netting out, a net impact that comes from the US exports. Translating all that into a global balance for LNG, looking at uh, demand, you know, this huge Asian demand here. I'm sorry. Why am I, oh, am I not in the, uh, This is supposed to be animated. Okay. Not working right. I've had this happen before. I think it's an issue of different PowerPoint technology. The animation's not showing well, but I'll try and explain through it. Um, this is a, a view of the market before the US LNG exports. So those red seasonal peaks show sort of moments of tightness in the market where you have to go to pipelines where the LNG supply is not particularly adequate. And it does show throughout the decade a constrained market. Now if you can visualize it without this um, problem with the legend, when you add on the blue line at the top, um, you basically relieve that problem and even create some surplus by the end of the decade where you're in a looser market environment kind of like the market we saw years ago when prices were under pressure because of the Qatari capacity before Fukushima. So this is, this is the way we see it. But we have taken account of the offsetting effect of some of the slowdown in Australia that may result from this US exports. Now turning to price, there's just a couple more slides to wrap up here. What could be the impact on prices? Before the animation, this is a view of what the shale spread looks like in the Pacific Basin before you have any big impacts from the Australian, the US LNG exports and so forth. And we see a spread of up to $13, very substantial. Continued spread, continued indexing of Asian prices to uh, JCC and Brent, or JCC which is pretty correlated with Brent. Um, US prices growing but pretty marginal, kind of holding to a, a, a cap range around $5. Now you bring in the exports and we see an uptick in US prices at the bottom. But as you'll see, this is a fairly small uptick when you compare it to some of the things that can happen as a result of the exports in Asia. We see that up to using the historical references about what happens in loose markets, the way the oil indexation, the S-curve slopes, and so forth work for uh, Asian pricing, we see this is actually, this impact is below a dollar, even though we didn't show it because it's a hugely political number. Um, this is over $2 or about $2. But that's for kind of average import prices, contract prices and so forth on the weighted average in Japan. But this additional $5 is kind of at the margin. This is the incremental contract and the incremental cargoes in Asia driven by the exports where you have possibly Australian and US uh, capacity competing with each other uh, to serve the market. So you end up with up to, for the marginal cargoes or marginal contracts, up to a $7 impact. The net result of all that is that you could have a shale spread on average decline to about $10, um, but at the margin could get down as low as $5, which is much closer to really what the logistic cost for liquefaction, shipping, Panama Canal and so forth are in reality. So that's, that's kind of the range. So say, call it five to $10. Somewhere in there is where the reality is likely to end up. Now, final, finally, what does it mean for the Americas and for LNG trade in Latin America? The way we look at this problem is, what's the opportunity cost for a US exporter to sell LNG into North America? If they have this opportunity to sell into Japan, Korea, Taiwan, the big markets of Asia, um, but they have to incur these over a dollar, some people say as much as two dollars of logistic costs to get from the Gulf Coast, say, to Japan, then what are they going to be willing to sell for in North America? So we see that the netbacks to the Gulf Coast could be in the range of 10 to 15 dollars, just, just south of that. Um, and when you look at the additional forward costs, if that's, if that's the opportunity cost net back to the producer, 
what would they be willing to sell for uh, you know, large volumes of cargoes, by Latin American standards anyway, significant block of cargoes, into Dominican Republic, or Chile, or Brazil, or Argentina, you have to add the forward transport cost from there to get to a delivered X ship price in the end markets. And, and the shipping costs you know, are not so great um, relative to each other, you know, range of say 50 to cents to a dollar moving around within the Americas from the US Gulf Coast that you have these big differences. And it, it pretty consistently gives you this range again all, with all the adjustments made of the 10 to 15 dollar range uh, by the end of the decade. So that's probably a reasonable range to expect for LNG prices coming from North America. Tying it all together, is there a win-win opportunity out there where the US exports and, and finds value in the Latin American market as compared to other international export opportunities and Latin American buyers and countries gain value from having access to this uh, new resource that is cheaper than LNG from other parts of the world because of proximity um, and also cheaper than petroleum products which are used extensively, diesel, heavy fuel oil and so forth in the power sector and industrial sector and the coastal regions all around Latin America and really all around emerging markets all over the world. Um, from a U.S. exporter's perspective, the small size of regional markets relative to other international markets could make it an attractive play for marginal capacity and cargoes um, in the short term, but possibly also an optional long-term outlet if shale spreads do collapse beyond the levels that I've suggested in the longer term and there's a desire to redirect cargoes and find new markets. Um, Latin American regional consumers, on the other hand, could gain access to new supplies that are competitive with global LNG driven as it is by Northwest European prices and by Asian prices um, and to petroleum supply alternatives which are very expensive and are expected to remain expensive uh, in, in most oil price forecasts. But building this regional trade will be subject to a lot of uncertainty and risks that need to be carefully monitored and evaluated. I've, I've mentioned US policy toward LNG exports is going to be an enormous topic. How do we implement that? Does, does the story end next year? Or does it just begin because of policy actions taken and the way the permits are issued and DOE's obligation or self-imposed obligation to monitor exports and study price impacts and things of that nature? Um, the sustainability of the shale spread itself and the export fundamentals, the economics of export to Asia and other markets. The sustainable, sustainability of the U.S. demand re renaissance and the LNG export impacts of that. Does it really materialize? How far does it go? What does it do to prices? And, and how much competing demand is there really in North America? Asian and European price markers and commercial response to LNG exports. Um, as those prices decline and buyers get more aggressive with all their suppliers, what does that mean in terms of the LNG trade and the implications for Latin America? Short and long-term opportunities for LNG capacity redirection. There's always a, a vibrant, the, the bigger the LNG business gets, the more vibrant the diversion business, the, the more interested terminal developers and owners and, car, and, and LNG aggregators are in diverting marginal cargoes or strings of cargoes to other markets. So there may be just blocks of opportunity or short-term opportunities for a period of months or years to get access to gas from North America that's, that's better than uh, what is available elsewhere. This all points to the need for constant monitoring, scenario analysis, to understand Latin America's regional LNG investment risks, rewards, opportunities, uh, and also to optimize portfolios both in the short term and the long term for buyers and sellers um, within a very uncertain market environment. Thanks very much for your attention. I know it's a lot of uh, material and look forward to the discussion. Presentation going to be available? Yeah, after I clean it out. <laughs> very, very good. Thanks. Excellent. Yeah, I, a good point is the, these slides will be available. If you didn't get it all down right? after I clean them up. After after Chris cleans them up, <laughs> so uh, don't you don't need to be writing furiously. And you, I, I want to know how you say shale spread in Spanish. How the interpreters are doing that. <laughs> 
It's got to be fun. Right, yeah. Okay, Manuel, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. You're going to get him loaded. Okay. I used uh, this microphone. The one oh, I'll uh, yeah. use one. this one, so it gives me freedom. Do you want to do this one? Yes. Can we pot up the uh, lavalier? There you go. So, and this is, sorry, yes. The, there is, so I'm uh, going to talk about the demand side of gas, especially in Latin America. And uh, so just uh, uh, to recall, uh, I'm from, originally I was from Tractable, then we merged with the Gas de France, Suez, and with International Power. International Power is one of the companies that Margaret Thatcher privatized at some point, so we are all that. And we, ha although we are called international power, which is very electricity, we are quite present in Latin America in the gas industry. So we distribute still gas in Argentina. Here it is. We transport uh, gas over the Andes. We participate here with others. We always burn the gas in, 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 uh, in power plants, plenty of them. By the way, here we have one of the power plants was the first one to use in Brazil Bolivian gas in Mato Grosso do Sul, so, um, which is not this one. And we regasify, we have a, a terminal in Chile, so in the north of Chile, regasifying gas. So that's a little bit our, our presence, and we have uh, several facilities, mainly our electricity in the region. Um, this is now going to, to the gas. Of course, here we have a um, million cubic meters per day. Christopher, uh, we have here France as reference because if we had United States, we need to multiply by 20 more or less. Okay. <laughs> so, but Argentina more or less is, is, is a little bit like France in demand. Then you have uh, Brazil, which demand increased lately started up uh, growing with the Bolivian gas. We have here on the, the sort of red line Chile where that grew and, uh, strongly and then was curtailed by Argentinian supply, so now it has LNG and that's why it has a sort of a comeback in the gas industry. And for example, we have uh, uh, other countries like that are rising. Peru is a very interesting case here. And last at the bottom, we have an island here in the Caribbean, which is Republica Dominicana. So uh, all of this, I think it's very interesting to see that uh, a lot of this industry is rising from, from very little. Eh? So from, it's very different to United States. You, you really have a, uh, okay, it's 10 year perspective, but a rising industry. What is also interesting is who, who drives the demand? Okay, well, the power generation sector drives great part of the demand. The industry, another part of the demand. Something that did not exist before and now exists 10 years later or 20 years later is transport, the gas, uh, natural gas in the vehicles. Okay, uh, and this is something different to what we have seen until now in the United States. No, no usage of nearly in, in, tra in vehicles. Here, this is a very important, uh, a little bit uh, dense slide, quite important. Here we have 1990 and 2005. So what it says, look, there has been, uh, it has electricity and gas. Eh? So, so gas is a... World map. Yeah. Sorry? No? No, no, no. Okay. So it, it has electricity and gas. And what you see is there has been a lot of of growth in, in, in an integration, and I have some cases that I would like to comment. So drivers for industry development, as the gas industry, is whenever the price was $2 a million BTU, you had a, an increase, important increase of, uh, in the gas industry. Not when it had seven, eight, or nine, when it had two. So that reminds us to the last Henry Hubs. And so, for example, when you had two, you could have Bolivia to Brazil. When you had two, you had five, uh, five pipes built between Argentina and Chile. When you have two, you can build a, a pipe across the Andes in Camisea. So, for example, this pipe in Camisea is a very interesting pipe. You, to build it, 
the, the pipes came from Houston to the entry of the Amazon River in 10 days, days. then they went uh, more than, than 30 days a month to, to build the, the things here in, in Camisea. And in the last bits, it's the same river, Urubamba, that, that comes out from Machu Picchu, and the last ones was one pipe per, per boat with an outboard. So that's how you had to build that. And so, why do I say all that? When you do a venture in Latin America, you need a, to put a lot of things together. So these uh, investments are, are of important size for Latin American scale. You, you, ha you need to bring together value that added of diverse play players. You have to align interest. I have some cases I want to mention. So the Chile case was very interesting here. We all more or less built demand, producers, <coughs> pipeline owners, where everybody was more or less happy. And after the, there has been the disruption, the industry more or less died, and we are starting again to, to, to be interested in, in, in the industry, and I will explain later. In Peru, this is a very important case. Here you have five or six uh, owners in the, in the fields, five or six owners in the pipe, five uh, or, or six important downstreamers consuming. Uh, and what is important here, why you can have a $2 price for the gas, because it has a lot of condensates. And condensates have, uh, condensates is, uh, I don't know, all, all, all that is, so we have a gas pipe and a parallel. Uh, NGL. NGL business. NGL, yeah, Yes, OK. We, we call it, okay, I have the Spanish word, but not the English word. Poliducto, we say in Spanish. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think uh, here, what, what is also important, so we had low prices. We, an anchor for the growth is the power generation is always uh, easier to, to build power generation, build volume based on power generation. We had some fuel substitutions. We had then the good prices for condensate. Long-term commitments uh, are very important. And then you have the, the other segments that, that develop. So uh, that was 1990 and 2005. Now this is something f lately. It's lately, we don't have that, that story anymore. We don't have that growth based on inter integration, etc. We have had LNGs appearing. So we have in Latin America, eight regas facilities, two in the Caribbean, two in Brazil, two in Argentina, two in Chile, and two liquefactions, one in Trinidad, which is several in fact, uh, Trinidad and, and Peru. Very important, the prices. I, won't, I can't go through all the table of prices, but if uh, you can fish it out in the, in the web of the of the institute later. But for example, I will go through some prices. Peru, you have, this is our prices of, at the consumer point. Eh? $3 a million BTU for power generation. And all prices are between four and seven for the rest of the segments. Horribly, horribly high prices are in Brazil. This is a little bit due to, to the value and in Chile. In Brazil, it's due to the value of the real and, and other things, but it's relatively high in Brazil. For example, for the industry, we're talking about $15 a million BTU, like in, in Chile, too. Uh, so high prices. So the important thing here, when you have somebody that, ha if, if you have a price of gas at $2 a million BTU, like in, in, in now in the United States, and the diesel or petrol is 20, in eight months you pay, repay nearly any co uh, commuting, eh? the, the repay all the investments of nearly anything. So I'm surprised that you don't have uh, uh, a transport turning into, into gas or whatever in, in, in the United States. I would think that you will have more increase of prices because of fuel substitution in the United States than from exports of LNG. It will take uh, two years to, to, to see. So when we see each other, Christopher, in two years, 
with. <laughs> okay, these are the LNG imports in Latin America. They're very volatile. Latin America uses imports for shortfalls mainly. Uh, Brazil, when it does not rain. Colombia, if it had a terminal, it would use it every five years, more or less. <laughs> uh, yeah. when, when it's uh, El Nino, La Nina, I don't know. Argentina, when it's, when it's winter. So it's, it's difficult to, to, to amortize a, a, a terminal. Um, well, nevertheless, you have a lot of projects around the place. So I said eight <laughs> are operating, all the rest of the nearly 20 are, are paper projects, some with a little bit more development than others. Eh? Uh, by the way, much more imports than, than exports. Um, so if I, if I go one slide further, here we have another possible new source of gas. And I say possible because it's not only the shale gas like you have in the United States. You have plenty around in Latin America. By the way, if you look at Latin America in the pie chart, it has one of the important sources of shale gas in the world. So it's relevant. And you have others, others that are sort of more in between more conventional and not exploited in Brazil. Central America. Central America is, is something that is, is, is interesting. You have a, a potential tremendous demand of, of, of natural gas. Again, again, why? Because they see the Henry Hubbard II, they pay for the petrol 20, uh, they pay for, for the fuel oil number six, $15 a million BTU, something like that. I don't recall exactly the number. Uh, and, and so there's a big spread. Now, of course, for, for all these, this is a more fragmented market. And the logistics, you would require a new concept in LNG, uh, uh, what we call the shuttle retail concept. It's something. We, we in Boston, we have a regasification where we uh, truck LNG by trucks. Okay, so in Boston, in, in the east coast of the United States. And uh, so that's a sort of a retail, if you want, a uh, retail concept. And, uh, but here it's in between something normal, like a, a normal boat for us, and how, how? Because all the all the the plants need, or you need to to have a tank, or you need to have. So it, it's quite complex, and it will take a little bit of, if you want, uh, imagination to resolve that. But it should be interesting. Um, so here are, is my last uh, conclusion slides, if you want, and so natural gas sector has been developed in different stages. So my, my, my test is always we need everything started with low gas prices. So some of it because we, the, the producer had good condensate prices and then he could uh, have low gas prices, but always you had that to start the industry. And you had all these pipelines growing. Then you had high oil prices and new shortfalls on gas and all these LNG terminals appeared on the, pro on the rest of the projects in Latin America. So shale and other sources of gas may push a new, a new development in the industry. And I, I would think that power generation can be the anchor again if we have a new growth in the industry in Brazil and you already see, for example, MAP Pechix and, and Aeon having gas to power, for example, in, in Brazil. Uh, and uh, condensates will, will be necessary to leverage also. So you have to think about those. Large ventures need joint efforts of new and existing players in addition to a framework. So I, I agree with you, Christopher, that it's important to have a framework. And, and what is also happened in Latin America, always that we did something, is because there were several players 
putting their acts together uh, to do something. I think yourself, uh, when you had the Quintero LNG, you had to put your acts uh, together with, with uh, Endesa, had to put uh, with, with other players, uh, with, with an app, with uh, AES, and, or, or not with AES, with somebody else then. <laughs> Metro with Metro Gas, etc. You had to put the acts together with, with, with other players. And, uh, and again, we will have to do that. So we won't have another stage if, if we won't put our acts together. We, uh, say five or six or so, or you need, we say in French, uh, five or six voluntades, uh, to, uh, to align five or six voluntades generally, at least that. Uh, uh, wills. Okay. Yes, uh, yes, but it's more than stakeholders. Eh? It's wills, stakeholders <laughs> with uh, with will to do it. Um, so here, I think uh, the, in the U.S., the demand side for shared gas development was not was uh, not an issue. There was always the pipeline, the downstream pipeline existed there. The demand existed in the United States. So if you produced the shale gas, you didn't have to worry about the commercialization of your shale gas. Or, or to finance it, you didn't need a, a contract of 20 years with somebody. Uh, here, here you have that issue. Um, and uh, I think Henry Hub price has been very volatile. We all want in Latin America, for example, in Central America, we want to buy now LNG from perhaps Chenier or somebody, or somebody like that. I, uh, Chenier did not pay me. Uh, but, uh, or somebody like that. And, uh, and then we find out that, that we don't know at what price would be the Henry Hub because they're always going to cost Henry Hub plus a spread, plus another spread, plus another spread. And uh, finally, you end up with Henry Hub plus six dollars a million BTU for the boat, for the commercialization or the aggregation, for the regasification, etc. So, and, and that's an incognito. So, well, anyhow, for sure something will rise because the oil, unless oil collapses, there's going to be a development of the gas industry unless oil collapses. Instead of if it's still at a hundred. Hundred dollars a barrel, or whatever, or eighty, or whatever. Unless there will be a development of the gas industry, is that for sure? So we need competitive long-term prices, long-term commitments, and long-term projects. And that's, I think, it's it's important because there is a lot of capital involved. So I think uh, thank you for your attention. And if you had, you will have a bonus if you log into. Uh, you will have another map. <laughs> <laughs>